Um, and for those who may not have had that kind of influence in their life, we just pray that they will know that they have a Heavenly Father who's perfect. One that one day they can look on and see and know what it means to be the Father that they always wanted. Thank You for the uh, opportunity we have to come and worship. Thank You for the opportunity to gather. Thank You for the beautiful weather. We just pray that today will be a time of enjoyment, a time of uh, worship, and a time that we look to You to know that You have the truth and the truth can make us free from all the problems we have in our world. Though they may not be in this life, that one day we will have eternity with You. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to do my best as I always uh, lie to you about every week about trying to uh, do a good job about managing time. I'm going to try again today. I know there's a lot going on that everybody wants to go and enjoy time together as a family. If you have children this morning that want to be part of Children's Church, we invite them now uh, to go and be a part of that uh, with Miss Jenny. I uh, had full intention of icing those uh, drinks down. Um, I put the handful of ice that was in our fridge in there, and I was going to go by the store and get some ice. The store's closed. Uh, there's bags over the gas pumps. Anybody know what's going on? They were out of gas yesterday. Really? That was odd, I thought. Hopefully there's not an issue there. Yeah. I hope not. Anyway. Um, so anyway, but they are uh, a little cool, but you might want to put them in the fridge before you drink them. This morning, we continue our study in the book of Revelation. The Antichrist is where we arrive this morning. Leading up to this point, we have seen, uh, last week we saw the dragon that is Satan be thrown out of heaven, be thrown out of the presence of God up until this point. And as far as we know now, uh, because this time is in the future, Satan has access to God. He has access to the throne room of God. We see that throughout Scripture, many places. And, and even, in, even in the New Testament, Jesus, remember, told Peter that Satan has demanded access to you that he might sift you like wheat. And it has been granted to him. He can demand things, but it can only be given to him if it's granted uh, by God. So Satan still has access to God because he asked to be able to have Peter. And he was granted access to Peter. Obviously we know that. And then back in the Old Testament with Job and, and in other places also we see Satan having access to God. But now we see Satan thrown out of heaven. Thrown down to the earth. His access to God gone. His maybe hope of some restoration in the future, though we know that that's not possible because His judgment has come. We know that now that is gone. So He is an animal backed into a corner is the best way that we can see this happening. And throughout history, He's known this is going to be His fate. Even from the beginning, because of His jealousy, of His pride, He wanted to be like God. Ezekiel tells us about that because of his pride. He wanted to be like God. And because of that, he was cast out of heaven. And he took a third of the angels with him. And we don't know how many that is. It's a lot. Those that were pent up and were released, we saw a few chapters back, were 200 million demons, fallen angels. That's not counting all the ones that are here now. And all the ones that won't be released. So who knows how I many? A lot. Uh, at one point, it, it uses the term like the sand on the seashore to refer to the demons, how many there are. There's a lot. So we see Satan now thrown out of heaven. Throughout history, he's known this was going to happen to him. See, in the beginning, he, he went and he tempted Eve, right? He said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God, knowing that God had told her not to eat the fruit. And again, we can't blame Eve for that because Adam's standing right there with her and God actually told Adam about that. But Eve eats the fruit, gives the fruit to Adam. Adam eats the fruit who was with her. And forever now, women are unable to pick a restaurant to go and eat at. I blame 
Eve for that. <laughs> but throughout history, I mean, we've seen Satan attacking the nation of Israel. Attacking the bloodline of Jesus. Not just the nation of Israel, but God chose to use the nation of Israel to bring Jesus. That was the woman that we saw is the nation of Israel. Gave birth to the child. Gave birth to Jesus. Then Jesus gives birth to the church. Now the church is taken off and now the attention turns back to Israel. And now Israel is taken away at this midpoint of tribulation, and Jesus, remember, said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee to the wilderness. Because it's going to get bad. It's going to get really bad. In Matthew 24, he talks about that. And I'll just read it real quick. I know you all are familiar with it. I've read it a couple of times here. But he says in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. And that is the Antichrist standing in the holy of holies, seating himself on the mercy seat, declaring himself to be God. That is the abomination of desolation. And we'll look more at that in a little while. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the rooftop not go down and take what is in the house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, it's going to be harder on them, obviously makes sense to us and alas i'm sorry pray that your flight not be in winter or on a sabbath for then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now nor will ever be if those days had not been cut short no human being would be saved but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short then if anyone says to you look here's the christ or there he is do not believe it there, that has happened since Jesus was on earth. There have been people always saying, I am the Messiah, come again, right? I mean, we've seen these things even in our most, even in recent history. I mean, you, you look at, you know, David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, he called himself Jesus. So did Charles Manson. So did Jim Jones. You know, these people lead people straight. They say, I am Jesus. And Jesus himself says, do not believe it when you see these things. They're pseudo Christ, they're counterfeits. So he says, false Christ will come, false prophets will arise and perform great signs. They will perform great signs and wonders so as if to lead astray even uh, the elect if possible. So I've told you this beforehand so that they will say, look, there he is in the wilderness. Don't go out. If they say, look, there he is in the inner room. Don't believe it. So even if possible, he's trying to lead the elect astray. But we know that it's, it's not possible. So the Antichrist is the one who is doing these things. The last verse of chapter 12, and chapter breaks in Scripture, and I've mentioned this before, are put there for our ease of reading. Um, and they're good, they're useful, they're helpful. When it was written, there was no chapter break there. This one is a little odd um, that there's a chapter break here between 12 and 13. So if you look at verse 17, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring... So Israel is in the wilderness, now being protected, being nourished. John tells us for 1,260 days, times time, half a time, 42 months, three and a half years. It's when this happens, right in the middle of the tribulation. That's how we know that's when this happens. So he went off to make war with the rest of Israel's offspring. So the rest of the Jews. He can't get to the real believer, believing Jews so he goes off to attack any Jews who may be not true believers, but Orthodox Jews is what we would call them today. And then those who hold to the commandments of God and the teaching of the testimony of Jesus. So Christians, believers, New Testament saints, tribulation saints, we would probably best describe them. That's who he's going to make war against now because he can't get to Israel. So he goes to the next best thing that he can get to. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And here's what I mean. That's an odd break in the chapter because the next verse, verse 1 of chapter 13, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. See, those things fit together. There's, it's kind of an odd break there. So he's standing on the, uh, on the sand of the sea. Satan is standing on the sand of the sea. And John says, I saw a beast 
rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. This is a different character. This is not Satan. Satan standing on the sand of the sea. And John sees rising out of the sea a beast with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its, ten, on its horns and blasphemous names written on its head, on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave, its, gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So here we see this dramatic scene. Satan is standing on the seashore, and out of the sea we see this beast rising. Again, this is a a, a separate creature from Satan. The beast is the Antichrist, and we'll see why shortly. Um, Just as a side note, these are real things, but they're also pictures. So when the Antichrist comes, he's not going to be a seven-headed dragon. It would be a little too obvious. Satan depicts himself as an angel of light, right? I mean, nobody's going to follow, you know, the Underwood deviled ham Satan with the pitchfork and the forked tail. It's just not going to, well, I mean, some might, but he's not going to lead anybody astray. They know who he is, but he shows himself as an angel of light. He comes with 99% of the truth, and the rest of it destroys the truth. So he leads people astray. But what John is seeing here is his character. So that we might understand who this is, what he represents, and what he's doing. Now, this is the place where we see the Antichrist described, but this is not the first time the Antichrist has been mentioned in Scripture. It's all over Scripture. Uh, John himself, we might look quickly, and uh, you don't have to turn here, I'll read it to you. You can, you can write these passages down if you want to. Um, but John himself in 1 John 2 8 said this in, in, in verse 18 Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. So he's saying there is one coming, an Antichrist, the Antichrist, is coming, but many Antichrists have come so far. There is one who is a pseudo. The word anti here is not necessarily against. He is against Christ, but a better translation would be a pseudo Christ, a fake Christ. So now he says there are many antichrists. There are many who are against Christ. There are many who are coming saying, "I'm, I'm Jesus, just like we just talked about. But there is one coming who is the antichrist. So that's what he's saying here. You have heard the antichrist is coming. They've already heard this. This is not new to them. So when John talks about this in Revelation, it's certainly not new. He said, you've been taught this before. Therefore know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They were anti-Christ. Paul talks about this as well. Again, and he uses very similar language. Um, If I can remember... Where this is, yeah, Second uh, Thessalonians two. Um, we'll just start start in verse one in Second Thessalonians two. This is a great place to look for this. And, and Antichrist is called many names. He's called the Beast in Revelation over and over again. He's called Antichrist by John. We just saw that. He's called the Man of Lawlessness. He's called just the One by Daniel and by Jesus. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Daniel calls him the One who will make the covenant with Israel. Here we see Paul, Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together with Him. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed. See, the Thessalonians had been persecuted severely and they had been told that Jesus had come and now they were in the tribulation. Jesus had taken the true believers off and now they were in the tribulation. 
But Paul is comforting them because they're being severely persecuted. He said, now, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together with Him. That's what they want. That's what we all want. We want to be gathered together with, with Jesus. He says, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either that a spirit has spoken a word or a letter seeming to be from us to the, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord. These are the same terminology. And, and, and I'm cross-referencing all this stuff so we can see this is throughout Scripture. The day of the Lord is the tribulation. We talked about that when we started looking at the tribulation. He said, don't be shaken or alarmed by those that are saying that the tribulation has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day the tribulation will not come unless the rebellion comes first, or um, your version may say the apostasy or the turning away comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So the tribulation cannot happen, Paul says, until the Antichrist is revealed. So th these are just many, many reasons why I believe that the church is taken off first, that there, is, there are prerequisites. Things have to happen before the tribulation can happen. The rapture can happen at any minute. But before the tribulation happens, Paul says that the Antichrist has to be revealed. He is the son of destruction. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself among every above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Remember, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, so this person, the same person, he opposes every so-called God and he takes his seat in the temple of God and proclaims himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? This is not new information. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. The Holy Spirit is called the restrainer in Scripture. That is what is restraining these things from happening is the Holy Spirit on earth. As the church is taken off of the earth, all believers are taken off of the earth, the Holy Spirit goes with us. And we saw that in the beginning of Revelation. We saw 100% all of the Holy Spirit in heaven at one time. If He's not anywhere else besides heaven, He's not here, we can't be here either. That is what is restraining this work from happening. So once the Holy Spirit is out of the way, once the church is out of the way, this is kicked off. Verse 8, And then the lawlessness one will be the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of His mouth and bring, by, bring to nothing by the appearance of His coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is the Antichrist. He is the man of lawlessness. Paul calls him. He is the one who will make a covenant with Israel. Daniel calls him. He's the beast. John calls him. The Antichrist. John calls him. It's the same character. We see the same language being used for him. Now, let's look at what he looks like. Let's look at how he's revealed. How do we know that this is the same character? I saw the beast standing, I'm, I'm sorry, I saw the beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. Now, just full disclosure here, um, there's a lot of different meanings that we could go with on ten horns and seven heads. And I will be honest with you, um, my belief on what this means exactly is in the process of evolving. I'll just tell you that. So I'm going to tell you that there are a lot of legitimate views about what this could be. And as I studied more and more this week, I kind of moved from one place and then transitioned, honestly, to, to a different place. So he sees this, this beast 
with ten horns and seven heads. And Daniel tells us about a beast with ten horns and seven heads. It's the same character in Daniel chapter 7. Um, we don't have time to go there right now, but you can look at the same beast rising out of the sea, ten horns and seven heads, and then another horn, a little one, comes and he uproots three horns. Horns are pictures of authority, are pictures of power. Uh, in the an, an animal world, they get their power by their horns, right? I mean, when you see animals fighting, they use their horns to fight with. And typically the one with the biggest, strongest horns wins the fight. You see that with cows or you know, deer or whatever. I know those are antlers, but you know, same thing. Whoever has the biggest ones, that's, that's, that's who wins. That's how they fight with one another. It's always been that way, so they're a picture of power. Heads. Heads are pictures of kingdoms, of leadership, of authority, of being the one that's in charge. So there's seven heads with ten horns. Um, and this is kind of where I'm evolving on this. I would have told you a few weeks ago that when Daniel said that there are ten horns that represent ten kingdoms, we do know they represent ten kings. Daniel tells us that. These ten horns represent ten kings. The ten kings that are over the entire world. I would have said, and it still may be the case, I'm not sure, I'm not saying that that's a wrong view. There are a lot of people who hold that view that one day there will be ten kings who control the entire world through ten kingdoms. And we see that through Daniel talking about the statue that he sees. The head of gold, and we looked at this before, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the thighs of bronze, the legs and feet of clay and iron goes out into ten toes. And Daniel, and the dream is interpreted to him, he said the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon because he controls the entire world. Then the the he doesn't see the next kingdom. He sees it. He just doesn't know what it is because it hasn't happened yet. But the chest of silver are the Medo, is the Medo-Persian Empire. The two arms, the Medo-Persians, the two coming into one, overthrew Babylon and then took the reign of Babylon so they control the entire world. And then Alexander the Great comes along and overthrows the Medo-Persian Empire, controlling basically the entire world. And then we see the Rome, Roman Empire come in and, and then take over and do the same thing. And then the Roman Empire splits, and that's where you get the legs. The Roman Empire split, splits into east and west. And then it kind of just dissolves into a lot of other things. There's no really official end to the Roman Empire. It kind of just dissolves into different things. And then we see the ten toes. And continuing with the image of the statue, the statue is Gentile rulership, leadership over the nation of Israel, over Jerusalem. We call that the time of the Gentiles, the age of the Gentiles. So I would have said that there are ten rulers, there are ten horns, there are ten toes that control the entire world. That would have been my view. And that was what we would be looking for to happen. We see these you know, nations that combine with one another to rule the world. And that's what many people look for, and it may be the case. But, I don't know that that's the case or not. Ten in Scripture is often used to represent a whole. Uh, the Ten Commandments is the easiest example of that. The Ten Commandments is not the full law, but it represents the whole law. I believe now that ten kingdoms is meant to represent all the kingdoms of the world. Not necessarily that there are ten kings that will rule the entire world, but it represents the kingdoms of the entire world. And I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a tangent there, uh, but I think either one of those views is a possible view. So then we see the Antichrist coming, being the little horn Daniel talks about, and uprooting three of those. And by that being able to destroy three kings, the rest follow him. And he becomes the most powerful. He becomes the ruler over those. And that leaves seven kingdoms, seven heads of this beast. So he is the ruler of the entire world. That's the point. So when he rises out of the sea, he has these crowns. He has these seven heads representing seven kingdoms, representing ten kings, represents the government of the entire world. This is what John is seeing. 
And on the beast I saw it was like a leopard. So the beast is like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's. They were like these things. Again, Daniel, when he talks about these kingdoms, he says the first one, Babylon, is a lion. The Medo-Persian Empire was the bear. And then the Greek Empire was the leopard. Here we see John using the same language. That's how we know that this is the same vision or the vision of the same character. But this character has all of these things. It's not separate kingdoms. Again, this represents the kingdoms of the entire world. So he's like a bear. He's like a leopard. He's like a lion. The point is, he represents the entire world government. So this is what John sees coming out of the sea. And to it, middle of verse 2, and to it, that is to the beast, the dragon, that is Satan, gave his power and his throne in his great authority. All the authority that Satan has. He's the prince of the power of the air. God has given him authority on the world. And just imagine what that authority will be like once he is removed from heaven. Once God takes the reins off of him. Once God takes Israel out of the way. He's taking the church out of the way. Now Satan has free reign. But Satan is choosing to work through this Antichrist. And this is not the first time the Antichrist has been on the scene. Remember, Daniel said, and I know I keep referencing Daniel, but you can't understand one without you can't understand Revelation without understanding Daniel. Daniel said that the tribulation will start. Paul said that the man of lawlessness will be revealed first. And Daniel said that the tribulation will start when a covenant is signed between the Antichrist and Israel the sacrifice and grain offering be restarted in their temple. That's what kicks off the tribulation. It's kicked off in a time of peace through peace agreements. And we saw the Antichrist also being the rider on the four horses and the four horsemen of the apocalypse that he comes bringing peace to begin with. And then war and famine and pestilence and all these different things. But he sets up this agreement between Israel and the rest of the world that they can have sacrifice and grain offering in their temple. But now he's seated himself. He's put an end to sacrifice and grain offering according to Jesus. And now he's seated himself in the Holy of Holies and declared Himself to be God. So this is the character that we're seeing. And verse 3, after Satan has given him all of his authority, he's handed over all of his authority to this Antichrist, to this beast, to this military ruler, to this leader, and Satan has used people like this throughout history as pseudo-Antichrist in a way, as pictures, I think, of what is coming. You know, you look at people like, I mean, Hitler is obviously the greatest example in our most recent history. Most of us know about Hitler, what he did. Who did Hitler attack? He attacked the Jews. Satan has always attacked the Jews. You know, and I was, I was reading a little bit about Hitler this week. He's a, he's a fascinating person um horrible one of the most evil people that ever lived but you know his his rise to power really he came out of obscurity this always comes from the bottom up rulers don't typically at least rulers that people follow don't come from the top down because the people won't listen to them right they don't know me they don't understand who i am they come from the bottom hitler was like a corporal in the army who just kept gathering steam and then there was terrible things going on in germany there was you know, there was uh, starvation, there was poverty, there was economic crisis, and he stepped in and filled that void, and the people followed him because he made these promises and he started fulfilling them. And people liked him. People listened to him. He was a great speaker. I don't speak German, but I've listened to him speak, and it's pretty, you know, you, it's like a bug zapper. You just want to hear him talk. It's pretty amazing. And the people that were closest to Hitler said that the voice that he spoke with when he was speaking in public was not his voice. It was weird. They said that's not the voice he has in private. So it's like he was demonic. He was certainly demonic. But in his public speaking, it's like he was controlled by Satan during that time so that the people would follow him because he was giving them what they wanted. You know, and there were others, especially in World War II. You had Stalin, you had Mussolini, you had Mao Zedong. You had all these people who were doing the same kinds of things. But they don't do it initially through this overtaking power and might. People don't follow that. They were men of the people who came up from under 
And the people followed them. And that's who this person is going to be. He's going to come bringing peace. And the people are going to follow him. Verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So one of its heads has a mortal wound. A mortal wound is, is death. One of the heads has a mortal wound. Now, here there's a lot of controversy over exactly what this means. Um, there are those that would say that, well, the heads representing governments, one of the heads was wounded, one of the governments falls. Uh, people equate that to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire fell. That was, that was the destruction of one of those heads, the, the last one. And then as it resurrects, as it comes back, this is the gathering together, together again of the Roman Empire. I think that's an okay view. I think that's a possibility. Another one is that he receives some kind of wound, uh, but it, because it's only one of his heads, it doesn't completely kill him. This is not a true death. This is some kind of fake death that people perceive as him being death. And then the wound is healed because he's not really dead. And, and Paul even says that he will lead people astray by his uh, fantastic lies. And it could be that this resurrection or this pseudo-resurrection, because we don't see anywhere in Scripture Satan being able to raise someone from the dead, that that could be what this is. It was a fake death, resurrection, and people see this and they follow after Him and worship Him because of that. Um, but if we look a little further down in the chapter in other places, that, that gives us some problems. Because when we see the false prophet come on it, we'll look at next week. Uh, look, look at verse 12. Talking about the false prophet, we're not going to study this, but just, just for reference. Uh, the false prophet says, it exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Listen, whose mortal wound was healed? So the first beast had a mortal wound. The Antichrist had a mortal wound. That is death. And it was healed. How can you heal a mortal wound? It's got to come back to life. And that, that's the view that I take. I, th I think what we see here and as we move forward, I think we'll see this a little more clearly. I think we see the Antichrist has been killed. He is legitimately, literally dead. Then we see Satan indwell his body and come back to life. It's a false resurrection. Now, if you'll remember, the two witnesses have been killed by the Antichrist. So they're already following him anyway. So as he is killed and resurrected and dwelled by Satan, the whole world, it said, worships Him and follows the beast. And we'll see in the second half of the chapter, if you don't worship Him and follow the beast, what happens? You're killed. It's over. That's the end. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? So they're worshipping Satan. And we look out at the world today and we say, well, we understand as Christians that there are those who are children of God and those are children of the devil. And there's really nothing else. There's no other options. But for us today, we see people who are not Christians. They don't know what they're doing. This is not blatant Satan worship that we see today. Even though they are following Satan, whether they realize it or not, when this time comes, there's not going to be another option. It's worship Satan or die. That is the only option that they have. And it says they worshiped the dragon. And it says in, in verse 3, the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. The whole earth. And they worshiped the dragon. And they said, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Now, it says the whole earth. Is that tribulation saints as well? Well, no, because Jesus said they will lead astray even the elect if possible. But we know that that is not possible, and we'll see why here in just a second. They say, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? That is language used for Jehovah God. Who is like God? Who can stand against Him? 
This is blasphemy. They're saying that this beast is God. That's the language that they're using here. They're saying that He is God. Now remember, He seated Himself in the temple and declared Himself to be God. And the people say, He's God. And they worship Him as God. And the beast, verse 5, moving forward, was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and conquer them. And authority was given over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And all who dwell on the earth worship it. Every one, so every, it says all who dwell on the earth worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So there's a loophole there. The whole world is worshiping Satan except those whose name was written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he must be slain. Here's a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. So, as Satan is cast down to earth and Israel is taken into the wilderness to be nourished for three and a half years, remember I said that Mercy and grace is gone. It's taken away. There's no more evangelism going on. There may be more that come to faith here, but this is pretty much the end of God's grace on earth. The beast was given a mouth. Notice he has nothing of his own. God is the one who allows this. God is the one that's in control. He's given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Do you think that if it was under the power of Satan that the 42 month period would be the end? No, it would never end. God is the one allowing this. It opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling of those who live in heaven. Daniel, again, and and just quickly, I think I'm in the right place here. If I'm not, we'll find out in just a second. Uh, Daniel chapter 12. He says, at that time, talking about the end times, shall arise Michael, a great prince who is in charge of your people. That's, That's the angel, the archangel Michael. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation until that time. Remember, that's the same language Jesus uses. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Israel's being delivered. Everyone whose name shall be written shall be found written in the book. Same language. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn away, who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the end time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase." Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood on the bank of the stream, and one on the bank of the stream, and, and someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed with linen who was above the waters in the stream, and he raised his right hand and his left toward the heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the people, of the holy people, comes to an end, all these things will be finished. That's how we know all these things are happening at the same time. Daniel tells us. Jesus tells us. John tells us. Paul tells us. These things are all happening simultaneously at the same time. During this time, the great tribulation, all under the control of the Antichrist and Satan. But under the allowance of God. So it opened its mouth uttering blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling. So He's claiming to be God. That is blasphemy. He seated Himself in the holy place, claiming to be God, that all would worship Him. So it was also 
allowed, again, same kind of language. He has no authority on his own. It was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. You say, well, that doesn't sound like much grace to those who are believers even in that day. Well, if you understand what's going on there during this time, death is the most gracious thing that can possibly happen. Because what happens when a saint dies? They go to be with God. This is hell on earth. They don't want to be there. So that is grace to the believer. It shortens the time of suffering. Is literally what it does. So He is given authority to make war and to conquer them. He's winning this earthly war. And authority was given, given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. There are no exceptions. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world. In the book of life of the Lamb who was slain, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He can destroy their body. He can kill them. He has the authority to do that. But He can't take their faith. That's what He wants. I mean, He knows it does no good to kill a believer. To be absent the body is to be present with the Lord, right? That's a win. Paul said, to live as Christ, to die is gain. We don't fear death as Christians. We don't seek it out, certainly. Because we know God has given us a, a role to play here on earth and we want to do that. We want to follow Him. But don't fear death if you're a Christian. Again, I don't look forward to dying. I, I like life. But the prospect of it doesn't bother me. I don't want to get sick. You know, Nobody looks forward to anything like that. That's terrible. That's part of the fall. But the fact that death is coming, I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. It doesn't bother me a bit. Because it's coming for everybody. And there, there are those today who look for something to save them from that. You know, any, do y'all know how much money is spent for people trying to not die? I mean, every medication you look on the internet is solid, full of these things are going to make you live longer, healthier, happier, all these different kinds of things. This is going to, and, and, and not even to actually live longer, but to look like you're younger. And, and that's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but people are trying to cheat death. That's, that's their goal in life, is not to die. And that, that's sad, that's unfortunate, but what the world is looking for is some kind of leader, some kind of ruler. Is the next president going to come and fix all these problems? Is the next king or the next prime minister or whoever, we've got all these problems. We have school shootings. We have people, that we have racism. We have women and children being abused. We have neglect. We have starvation. And everybody makes a promise. I'm going to fix the problem. I know what everybody else has done wrong since the beginning of time. I'm going to fix it. One day, a man is going to come. He's going to make that promise and he's going to fulfill it and his name is going to be Antichrist. And the whole world is going to follow him and destruction is going to come after him. But as a Christian, that's not what we look for. You know, I hope there's peace in the Middle East. I hope starvation comes to an end. I hope children don't die of cancer anymore. But no earthly ruler can bring that. But when the Antichrist comes, he's going to make these promises. And there's going to be fulfillment of them. He is going to bring power through peace. But the peace is not going to last long. But it's going to be too late when he does. For the Christian, we know that the one who is going to come, who is going to take away sin, who is going to take away death, who's going to take away suffering and pain is not going to be an earthly ruler. That's not who we're looking for. When He comes, there won't be any question. That's why Jesus said, when you see these false Christ, because that's the promise that Christ made that He's going to do these things, when you see these false ones coming, do not follow them. No matter what they do, no matter what they say, because they're liars. No matter what kind of peace they bring, no matter what kind of hope they fulfill, they are liars. And listen, I'm not saying if somebody comes and says, hey, I found this thing that's going to cure cancer, that we don't celebrate that. Praise the Lord. That's what we want. right? I read a story a couple weeks ago that there was a study done in New York, and I want to follow up on it some more, that the, uh, dealing with colon cancer, that they had 18 patients that they ran this 
experimental drug on them for six months or whatever and had a 100% cure rate. That is something to celebrate right there. So we should celebrate those things. But they're not eternal. They're only temporal, right? Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. John says, I'm speaking to you. For us, we won't be here. But for those that are, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And that is, if anyone has the ability to understand what I'm saying, these are the saints that he's talking to. And this is the eighth time, I think, that this language has been used in Revelation. Every other time was the letter to the seven churches. And what did he say? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, here the church is not here anymore. So he says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And here's what he has to say. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If they're going to come get you, they're going to get you. That's the comfort that He's given them. He's saying don't fight it. It's going to happen. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword He must be slain. This is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. He's talking to the believers. He's saying they're going to get you. You're going to be taken captive. You're going to be killed. So be it. Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. We don't fight back against our faith being persecuted with weapons. Now, that's not to say if somebody breaks into your house to harm your family that you don't protect yourself. That's, that's a different thing. But when somebody comes persecuting you for your faith, the way to win that fight against that persecution is not with guns and swords and whatever it might be. That's earthly power, right? And John is letting them know here that God is in control of this. If you're going to be taken captive, you're going to be taken captive. If you're going to be killed, you're going to be killed. This is a call for the endurance of the saints. So we see evil in the world. And, you know, I think for many of us, we, we look at the evil things that are going on and we say, there, there are bright spots. You know, there are times when things get better. But we shouldn't expect there to be long-term healing of anything. It's only going to get worse. And that should point us closer to God. You know, it's, it's just so crazy what's going on in the world, so many things, but it's been like that from the beginning. You know, we look around now and say, well, this evil thing's happening, this terrible thing's happening. It's always been that way. I think now it's more in our face. Certainly, there's certainly more antagonist actions toward Christians and toward God in general, I mean, we just look at the only thing you got to do is look at the gender ideology stuff that's going on, and people say, Well, that doesn't bother you. When you take away a girl's ability to be able to compete in sports, or you take away, you know, children's life at the young age, they give them, they give little girls double mastectomies, and they have physical surgeries on little kids and give them cross sex hormones, and just this things that just are unimaginable to children. We don't think a child has the ability to be able to drive a car without killing someone. Even after they got a license for the most part. You know? But we trust them to make permanent decisions about things like that. That's evil. You know, and I, I debated on whether they even mentioning this or not, but this week I watched a documentary. Um, you've probably heard of it called What is a Woman? And just full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the Daily Wire and Matt Walsh and Ben Shapiro and those guys. And, you know, that may upset some of you and it probably won't surprise many of you. I don't agree with everything they say. And I don't recommend you watch this around your children either because it's got some stuff in it that they don't need to see. But he talks to these people and asks them questions. What are you doing? And they reveal the evil that they're doing to children. Chemical castration that we give to sex offenders they're giving to little boys. And the world is just going right along with it. And if you question it, you're the evil one. So what do we do with that 
as Christians, as believers. We look at things like that, and I do think it's getting worse. You know, there are people in the world who have dealt with that kind of, not necessarily that, but this kind of evil for centuries, and now it's here, I believe. And we live in a place where there's a lot of Christians, so it's not as in our face here, but it will be. It's coming. When it does, do we, do we fight physically? I think we stand by our convictions and we stand up for the truth. But Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this world. It's going to come. So as Christians, we need to know it. We need to understand it. We need to know what the truth is. And in that documentary, he goes a lot into, you know, what is the truth? What is, that's, that's his question he asks at the end of What is a woman? And none of them can answer. And he says, well, they'll ask him, well, whose truth are we talking about? And he's like, the same truth that says we're sitting here in this room. There's only one truth. Reality. And when that gets so confused, and that is Satan confusing the truth, the only place we can go is to Christ. Because what did Jesus say? Know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's the only hope we have. So why don't we care about this? Why don't we teach this? Why don't we need to know what's going to happen in a time when we're not going to be here? Because John said, Antichrist is coming, but there are many Antichrists that are here now. We need to see this for what it is. And I would used to say that I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the conspiracy seemed to make them make a lot more sense every day. Again, don't run off chasing everything, but know what's happening and know where the power is behind it. And go to the truth, because we have the truth. But speak the truth in love, not in hate. And the truth will make us free. The truth will set us free. God, thank you so much for the truth. We don't know why all the things happen that happen. We don't know why you allow bad things to happen to good people. We know you have a plan and we know you're in control. And even as we look at this time of tribulation, it's so difficult for us to even look at and read and to understand that you would allow something like this to happen is comfort to us to know that you are the one allowing it. That it is for your great purpose. Thank you for rescuing us from that. Thank you for moments of light and peace that come to the world. Thank you that we do have hope in this world that maybe there will be peace and places in the world. Maybe there will be cures for cancer. Maybe there will be something come along that helps starvation. But we shouldn't be deceived into thinking that that is the hope being fulfilled that we have. Thank you that our hope is in Christ. Eternal hope. Eternal peace. No more death. No more sickness. And that's what we look forward to. But don't let us keep that to ourselves. Those that we love need to hear that too. This Father's Day, I pray that we laugh and enjoy each other's company and eat good food. We're so thankful for those things. Bring us back here next week if that's your will. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with me and read the Great Commission, we'll be dismissed. Read with me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As Christ has commanded, let us go and do. You're dismissed.